this is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, the CEO of Franco Nevada, successful model, fantastic returns. Emerald Health CEO on the company's big joint venture with Village Farms. The head of Two Cows, a hidden gem disrupting in mobile and internet in the United States. And the CEO of Trex, outperforming the composite with composites. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Nobody makes a buck in the mining business like Franco Nevada. The company's returns have more than quadrupled since their market debut in 2007, leaving industry peers in the dust. And it was all done without sticking a shovel in the ground. Franco Nevada employs a royalty and streaming model, financing for miners today in exchange for a slice of their production tomorrow. It's a strategy high on upside and low on downside for a number of reasons. For one, it doesn't require direct funding of a project's capital expenses. This allows Franco Nevada to benefit from rising commodity prices, but avoid the drag of rising costs. Number two, it's high margin with very low overhead, meaning it can generate cash throughout the commodity cycle. And three, it's extremely scalable, allowing the company to use the cash it generates to acquire new assets and focus on growth. Franco Nevada has turned all that free cash into more than 370 assets around the globe, most of them in Latin America and North America. And while the portfolio is chiefly in gold, it's also broadened with exposure to silver, platinum and oil and gas. This diversity gives Franco an almost cycle-proof strength that investors are more than happy to pay a premium for. During the past few commodity bull markets, Franco Nevada vastly outperformed the leading gold miners index and bullion itself. And when times got tough between 2013 and 15, the company's shares held up much better than those two. All the while, Franco paid out more than $900 million in dividends to investors, and it leads the entire industry in annual payouts. There's plenty more runway for Franco Nevada in the coming years. The company is aiming to bring online a handful of major royalties in short order, most notably the Cobre Panama and Tazius projects. Management also has more than $1.3 billion in buying power for further acquisitions. Franco's CEO, David Harquail, explains his strategy for taking the company to new heights. David, tell us why the, the Cobra Panama asset is so important to Franco Nevada. Why is it so significant? Well, it's a, it's a focus for the, uh, the street right now because uh, they're trying to time when those revenues start hitting our income statement. And, and we can uh, report some uh, uh, earnings from it. Uh, right now we're expecting that's going to start early next year. And the construction's been going very well. It's one of the largest mines being built anywhere in the world. It's going to have a life I believe will extend from 35 to 50 years at a minimum. And we get the gold and silver from this project uh, uh, over that time frame. So it's a, it's a large investment. We have 1.36 billion committed to it, US dollars. And it will represent about you know, if we do nothing more, it's about close to 20% of our EBITDA and our revenues in the future. Uh, but we expect we'll be growing our other assets as well. So we'll be bringing it under 20% of our company. So which of your other assets are you most excited about? Which projects are you, are you most excited about in 2018? You know, it, well, I think there's a lot of projects just starting up and uh, expanding. So right now we have the benefit of the expansion that's happening at Tazius with Kinross Gold. They're doing their phase one. They'll be making a decision later in the year whether they do a further expansion of that project. But that's a substantial step up on our cash flow from that project. The other one is the Subica mine in Ghana with Newmont Mining. Uh, they're just commercializing the expansion of that, that mine. It's going to be a very long life, uh, high grade operation, and uh, so it's a good step up. And the beauty about these expansions is, is we don't have to pay for any of this. It's just additional gravy for our shareholders. And your hands are nice and clean, as it is like to say in the streaming business. Well, we don't, we don't have to get involved in individual operations. We actually have 50 different mines <clears throat> producing revenues to us right now. And as we mentioned, there's a few more coming on in the next few years. Uh, but the key thing is, because we don't have to focus on individual mines, we just can step back and just, just say, where's the best place to allocate capital? Because we're not caught up in the day-to-day -day of managing these, these uh, operations or managing issues. Now you've got about $1.4 in available cash. You're yeah. always acquisitive. How acquisitive do you expect to be in the next uh, year or two? Well, we've been very busy this year already. We deployed uh, over $450 million in the first quarter. I think we've telegraphed to the street that we still see uh, have a very active pipeline. 
Uh, there's lots of opportunities available for us right now, especially in the oil and gas royalty space in the U.S. And we've telegraphed to the street we expect to be doing more of those. Let's talk about gold itself, uh, David. Had that huge run in, in 2011, and now we've seen consolidation, and it's kind of been going sideways in a range for a few years now. So is that a good thing in, in that it's building a base, or is it not responding as it historically should to geopolitical risk and other factors? You know, right now, gold has been facing the biggest headwinds ever. You have to look at it, rising interest rate environment, strong S&P 500 uh, environment. Also, you've had all the speculative interest move to the Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and, and cannabis mm -hmm. stocks. And yet, gold is held up at $1,300. And now we're just getting the first whiffs of inflation coming in the system. And so I actually am very encouraged. The amount of apathy to the gold sector is, is, is it's the most apathetic I've ever seen it. And so I believe it's going to catch people surprise and by surprise. If you remember the beginning of 2016, we had that first bit of run on the gold price. There was a huge swing on the gold equities. Now, it didn't follow through, but I think the next one, there's going to be a follow through. And I think the people are going to find the window's going to be a little, or the door is going to be a little small to get through uh, when that happens. You touched on it a bit there. Your, your, your stock has performed incredibly well the last 11 years. You know that. 18% Kager for the yeah, last 10 years. Right. Yep. Beating peers, beating uh, producers, yeah. beating uh, gold indexes. So you started out to do something in 27, uh, 2007, mm -hmm. and you've uh, achieved uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, how gratifying is that? Is that? Very gratifying, but uh, it's a reflection of the business model of the original Franco Nevada with Seymour Schulich and Pierre Lassan. It was also, in the 80s and 90s, the best performing gold stock uh, in the index at, for exactly the same reasons that we have it right now. So all we're doing is executing on the same business model, the same principles. We're trying to play the long game. We're not trying to chase the, 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 uh, the, what's popular in the market. We try to buy counter-cyclically. So most of the investors, you know, we're not doing the popular thing when we buy, buy things. And so now people are getting to appreciate why were we buying oil of royalties two years ago in the U.S.? Now there's a, an appreciation for it. I think uh, us uh, not doing gold deals right now because we think the mines are going to get built in the future. And whenever there's a liquidity crisis, that's where we can add assets. So I think we stay disciplined. We can continue this for indefinitely. We feel like we're the wave of the future in terms of how people test for things. Uh, we anticipate being the first sample to answer instrument that can process up to 22 pathogens at a time. Whatever you want to test for, you can do it on your own. Uh, you don't have to ship it away to a lab. You don't have to have an expensive microbiologist. It's something you can do on site. You collect that sample, you input it into the machine, you hit a button, an hour later you get the result you're looking for. Emerald Health Therapeutics is taking a diversified approach to the cannabis sector. In a market riddled with more of the same bulk pot producers, Emerald is building wider exposure. The company is building a large-scale facility and owns half of a supersized joint venture with Village Farms. Emerald also owns one of Canada's few licensed dealers where it tests cannabis for others and develops high-margin medical-grade product. It's in the process of establishing a distribution channel focused on selling these products to pharmacies across the country. Emerald Health's Pure Sun Farms venture with Village Farms has options for nearly 5 million square feet of growing space. 250,000 square feet are already up and running, and another 1.1 million will kick in by 2019. Village Farms CEO Michael DeGilio is a regular guest on the show. The company has three decades worth of experience operating greenhouses. Despite this wealth of diversity, Emerald Health seems underappreciated by investors. The company is worth only about 20% of some of its largest peers, even though its production potential is right up there with the best of them. That means Emerald Health could be a sleeping giant. CEO Chris Wagner explains the key development milestones he intends to hit that will wake up investors to the value of his company. So the, the market obviously is huge. You know, it's probably in the neighborhood of uh, 26 billion if you include cannabis and, and some of the um, associated industries along with cannabis. And so we've really been focused on three main things. The, the, the first thing is achieving very large scale, low cost uh, production of cannabis. So growing our facilities as fast as we can uh, to be prepared for the recreational market in 
Uh, you know, we're, I, I think reasonable estimates are now probably September, October, something like that. Um, so, so getting prepared for that by growing a lot of cannabis and, and uh, secondly, uh, spending a lot of time on product innovation, actually creating brand new products that, um, that don't exist today and um, filing intellectual property on those. And then the third and, and, and um, probably the most fun part is um, some of the uh, branding and, and, and marketing work that we're doing uh, to, to prepare for that. So I, I think probably what's most important for people to understand is that we are a very large scale um, producer of cannabis. We um, have a facility in Delta. It's a joint venture with Village Farms, which is 1.1 million square feet. That's about 23 acres of, of land. It's massive. Um, and it's really set up so that we can um, enter into large scale supply contracts with uh, provinces and other very, very large buyers producing extremely high quality, um, uh, high, high, high volume um, products. So that that facility um, is uh, growing already where we've uh, uh, harvested from that facility uh, where we are ramping it up over time. By, by the time uh, the whole facility is built out, which will be the end of this year, um, will be on track to produce around 75,000 kilograms of cannabis from that building. So that, that, that's a lot of cannabis. Let's get to some numbers here. In your most recent quarter, revenue was nicely higher, but the loss widened, uh, which uh, could be expected because you're spending to, to build scale. But uh, what can you tell investors in terms of uh, a timeline to profitability? Yeah, we're you know we're extremely focused on getting ready for the adult use market in in, in Canada, and then uh, the second wave of that, as we were talking about, is is creating new and 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 innovative products that, quite frankly, um, we hope will um, produce billions of dollars worth of, of of revenue. You know, I've I've in the past launched several different products um, in the pharmaceutical industry, each of which have achieved individual products achieved billions of dollars of revenue. And so it takes some time and some energy and some money to um, to, to get those products um, into the market, but it's it's really worth it. So, so at the moment, we're not um, focused on achieving profitability right away. We're focused on expansion, uh, hitting scale, uh, developing the, these, uh, these new products and making sure that we uh, deliver high quality products that Canadians and, and, and other people uh, feel confident in, in consuming. We're proud of the fact that we've been profitable every year since inception. If you have a business and, and you have a vision for it and you want to borrow some serious money, you have to know who your lender is. You have to trust them. What we're doing is providing the capital that enables them to realize their ambitions. Money means everything to people who don't have it. We're here. We're stable. We have 40 years now. We're looking at the next 40. You can take these guys to the bank. Have a look at this blue line in this stock chart. It's not Apple or Google or Amazon shares, but with growth like this, it's easy to make that mistake. It's actually Two Cows, a Canadian tech company you may never have heard of, but probably wish you had. Shares have soared a cool 750% over the past five years, more than three and a half times the NASDAQ Internet Index. It's all thanks to a quietly lucrative business that's a cash cow. Two Cows is the world's second largest registrar of dot-com internet domains. It's responsible for about 24 million domains with new domain requests cropping up all the time, providing the company with a steady stream of new revenue. As a result, Two Cows is a cash generating machine that has steadily raised its top line each year. That's given the company the funds it needs to finance its next legs of growth. And that's mobile phone service and high-speed internet access in the U.S. Two Cows Ting Mobile has more than 160,000 subscribers and adds about 10,000 each quarter. Ting Internet has 5,000 customers and a potential reach into 17,000 homes. Both businesses are expected to become significant fixtures for Two Cows in the coming years. Two Cows wants to expand Ting Internet's reach to 40,000 homes by shelling out $30 million to lay the groundwork for future growth. Echelon Wealth Partners predicts the mobile and internet businesses will account for nearly half of Two Cows total revenue by 2020. Two Cows knows that stepping into big telecoms turf won't be easy. That's why it's targeting smaller cities in the U.S. where industry giants are less present. 
Still, it's an expensive undertaking that requires careful execution. CEO Elliot Noss explains the nuts and bolts of the company's strategy and how he sees it transforming the company. So two cows, so number one, is the, the second largest domain registrar company in the world. So how did you manage in a general sense to scale that like you did and to differentiate yourself from others? Yeah, so I mean, we were lucky uh, and were a creature of time and place. Competition came to domain registration in 2000. It used to be a monopoly before that. Obviously, when you move from monopoly to competition, lots of opportunity. We created, essentially, wholesale domain registration. By that, I mean uh, we provide a platform, a back office, to companies like Shopify and Squarespace, uh, Vistaprint, and thousands and thousands of others. And uh, we, were, uh, we had something that fit the market at the right time. Since then, we've executed in a very competitive, very low margin business. We've made a couple uh, 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 tuck-in acquisitions along the way. Most importantly, we've had a, 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 an extreme customer focus and that's allowed us throughout uh, uh, everything else to just build and build and build until we are where we are. So you're called two cows and your domain registrar business is a cash cow and that allows you to move into nice segue do you like that and move into uh into mobile and internet in the united states so tell us about ting mobile pretty strong growth lately uh as you're talking about competitive marketplaces that's one mobile and so so how are you how are, what's your strategy there well uh, we entered that market in 2011 and um, you know, when you talk about that being a competitive market, of course it is, and in many ways, you know, it's a U.S. Uh, uh, only service. Um, a lot of that competition has come since 2011, but most importantly, we were coming from the domain registration business, which was an extremely competitive business. Mobile phone service looked easy to us on a relative basis. You know, we described competition at the beginning as if we had gone from altitude down to sea level. You know, the oxygen was just richer. And, and again, then there was a lot more white space in those early years. You know, so now we're at a place with that business where we've built a nice base and uh, we've got to find the white space in that business going forward to continue that great growth. What's the growth like in terms of uh, subscribers? Well, we've typically been growing. Now, we always look at uh, uh, cash contribution or EBITDA. Uh, uh, more than subscribers. So, you know, we look at that, that, that growth in that business has been, you know, from zero to uh, about 270,000 devices over the course of six years. Uh, it's been pretty consistent through that period. So, you, you know, you can kind of do that. And then you've got uh, Ting Internet. Your strategy here is smaller U.S. cities. Uh, I won't answer for you, but uh, it's a uh, less competition, fragmented market. Is that where you're going that route, or? Uh, no, this is really about ramping and scale. So, uh, you know, you want to think about these two businesses that we've talked about as real cash generators with no capital requirements, essentially. So, uh, over time, we end up uh, piling up cash, and we had an unleveraged balance sheet. Now, we could take the skills that we developed. We're a bunch of old ISP guys. We love this business. Uh, we could take the skills that we developed, intersect with the capital and the ability to run construction projects, and we get the, uh, I mean, I can only call it, you know, the fantastic opportunity to be part of, uh, you know, what the future of Internet access is. Everybody knows fiber to the home is the end game. The question is always when and making the economics work. You know, it's, it's interesting when you think about it. Uh, telecom is really the biggest technology business in the world. You know, biggest technology market in the world, mobile phone service in the U.S. Second, home internet service in the U.S. Yet those markets have not had significant innovation. You know, it's really going to be with fiber that we'll see that. And we're able to take the combination again of skills and capital and really take advantage of that. So we're building up. You know, it's a big expensive market and uh, uh, we're just, you know, going at it the way we do consistently, methodically, uh, comfortable in uh, new opportunities, comfortable in white space, uh, and on we go. Let's ask, uh, let me ask you about your stock because if, if uh, somebody were to see, say, a 10-year chart and not know what the company was, they'd go, wow, yeah. I, sh I wish I had owned that thing. 
So you're kind of like a hidden gem on the market. And, 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 and could you explain why you're sort of still undervalued despite your success and why the markets fully don't get the story, it seems? Sure. Um, you know, we're very iconoclastic in the way we go about it. Uh, First of all, you know, I've been running this business for 22 years. Uh, essentially, we've never raised money. Uh, we went public by way of a reverse merger, which got us delisted. We did it for operating assets. We've never sold a share from Treasury. Uh, in fact, we've bought back 50% of the float. Uh, so we just, you know, we're non-traditional in the way we go about it. I spend as little of my time marketing uh, the stock as possible so I can spend my time operating, which is what I enjoy doing. And, and what happens over time is you get the investors you deserve. So we have a fantastic base of value investors, uh, some very small, some very, very big, uh, you know, in terms of their assets under management. Uh, and they tend to be much longer term, uh, much more patient, much more interested in companies that are focused on generating and alloc generating capital, generating cash and allocating capital. You know, that's not the sexy story. We rarely tell the sexy story. So, uh, you know, we're there if you want to find us and plenty of people have. <laughs> Blockchain is going to be big. It's early days right now. It's much like the internet in the 90s, and we want to be in early, and we're diversifying our investments so we can sort of pick those winners and in 10 years from now, see the benefits from today's investments. We were one of the first public companies to dedicate ourselves exclusively to blockchain. We know that in five to 10 years from now, it is going to define consumer life, finance, real estate, healthcare, and we offer a good exposure into this early technology for our investors. The blue line you're going to see here is Trex, a maker of composite products used in outdoor decks. The niche player has broken out in a big way over the past year, crushing the broader home builders index and building products subgroup. That outperformance is hardly a blip on the radar either. It's backed up by some very sturdy fundamentals and impressive execution. Trex has developed a low cost manufacturing process that turns recycled materials into high end products. It's paired that with very effective marketing and a wide distribution network. As a result, Trex has enjoyed rapid revenue and EBITDA growth while fattening profit margins above 43%. The company is now the world's largest composite deck maker, owning nearly half the market. Trex offers consumers a compelling value proposition. Its composite decks cost more upfront than wood alternatives, but last twice as long and are half as expensive over their lifetime. That's the sort of trade-off homeowners are willing to make, and it's not likely to change anytime soon. Consumer confidence in the U.S. has been tracking higher for some time now and is expected to hit a fresh high this year. That's helped bolster home remodeling budgets, which have also steadily climbed since 2013. Composite products have been capturing a larger share of those dollars, and research firm Principia sees that continuing through 2020. Trex has seen just about everything break its way, from economic fundamentals to low input costs and even tax policy. Analysts understandably love the company, but some question how much more upside is left to wring out of the stock. Trex CEO Jim Klein has heard that before. He recently joined us to explain his plan to keep sales humming, margins expanding, and shares climbing. Jim, Trex is number one in North America in composite decking using recycled materials. So what would you say your competitive advantage is and why uh, are your products superior for consumers? Well, I think, first of all, the competitive advantage is uh, uh, basically derived from the brand as well as uh, our attributes of our product. Uh, our products are uh, basically scratch resistant, they won't fade, and they won't stain. And uh, there are other people who have copied us, but we were the first there, and obviously being first helped to drive our position in the marketplace. Now we talked in the introduction, Jim, about the company's strong growth. You've got about 45% market share in North America. But as you know, this has been a very long economic cycle. So how comfortable are you that you can sustain this growth and that, that costs won't get out of hand? I'm talking about input costs. Well, we're fortunate because we are a company that embraces recycling. 
our cost of manufacturing is significantly lower than competitors. Uh, those costs uh, are drifting downwards as we find different types of waste polyethylene, uh, plastic bags, stretch wrap, and other materials. We constantly see an opportunity to continue to reduce our uh, material costs. So from that standpoint, we're very comfortable with it. From a volume standpoint, I think the important thing to recognize is that the vast majority of the decking sold in the United States today is wood. About 83% of the lineal feet sold are wood, and wood alternative is only 17%. So huge opportunity there in North America. Jim, your company, Trek, says that you're number one in consumer awareness, number one in web search, traffic, social media, sales, and market share in the decking market. So how do you accomplish all that? How do you uh, have such a uh, high awareness? A uh, strong focus on the brand and as well on the consumer. A few years ago, we made the strategic decision to focus a significant portion of our efforts to bring the consumer to our website so that we can help uh, them learn more about decking and how to approach their decking projects. And it's been extremely successful. You recently made a deal, uh, I, I believe one of the first in a long time, uh, buying SC companies for nearly $72 million. This company is in commercial railing. So, uh, for example, Dallas Cowboy Stadium. Uh, I'm just uh, mentioning that for, for the viewers who may uh, want to know exactly what the company does, and you'll tell us more. But uh, why did you make that deal? And what do you say to those uh, analysts or investors who say, well, this is kind of a low margin business, so we're not sure about this acquisition? Well, no, number one, we looked at this category for a long time, looked at a number of companies before we made the decision to go after SC. Uh, SC offered a good management team and a good product offering and a strength in the arena and stadium business that's second to none. They've done about 85% of the stadiums and arenas, major stadiums and arenas in North America. So strong opportunity there. Uh, we see SC as an opportunity, number one, to help them grow their margins, but also to cross market between tracks and the commercial side of the business. And lastly, Jim, as far as the stock, it's done tremendously well. As you know, uh, investors seem to love it. A lot of analysts are very high on your company, but some of them are uh, a little concerned about the valuation. So do you agree that uh, the stock is a bit richly valued or can you convince investors otherwise that you're, you're fairly valued here? Well, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I talk and have talked with a lot of investors over the last 10 years. And without a doubt, every time uh, the, the stock is doing well, whether it be at $3 a share, $7 a share, 14, 21, 72, or now 120, everybody thinks the stock is overpriced. And what this management team has been able to do is prove them wrong every time. And our management team is driven uh, to drive results. And I think if you look at our track history, we've proven we can drive results and I would expect that those who invest in the company will be rewarded in the future. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. We have a podcast as well, Capital Ideas Radio. You can listen to that through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. That's it for now. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.